Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Open Active Adoption and Engagement Forum on Friday, the 7th of July, 2023. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. I just start with the usual couple of uh, quick reminders um, for anyone new to the group or, or anyone new watching on the recording that um, we have an Open Active Slack workspace, and that's a great space place to kind of keep up to date with everything that's going on in the slack in the in the slack community in the open active community um and uh, interact with other people who are working on open active and, and in, members of the community and um, get support hear about updates it's, it's a it's a really good place for all of that so if you're not already a member please do sign up and there's the link there and if you're watching the recording there'll be a link to these slides in the uh, description underneath the video and um, so just click through to the slides and, and there'll be all these links on there also to the um, previous slides and previous recordings of previous AEF meetings a uh, quick look at the agenda today um, it's going to be a bit Jumbled, jumbled around from from what's on here, but we've got uh, Daro Sullivan from Sport Ireland. Hopefully, will be joining us. And um, he's had a bit of a meeting clash, so he should be joining us about eleven o'clock. Um, and so we'll be hearing from him in the second half of the meeting. Um, and then, so the first half of the meeting, um, these uh, switch switch around for what's what's on the screen there. Um, we'll be just giving a bit of an update on uh, a, the use case framework work, um, something that we've covered a little bit in uh, previous AEFs. Um, but yeah, we'll just give a bit of an update on how that work is progressing. Um, and then hopefully there'll be a bit of a chance at the end for um, any other business and people to raise any questions or, or updates they might have. Um, so we'll start quickly um, with a with a quick round of introductions as usual, if that's okay for everyone, um, just to help everyone get to know anybody who's new to the group and, and anyone on the recording to sort of get a sense of, of who's who's in the meetings. So if I could start with uh, you, Andrew, please. Uh, thanks, Tim. I'm Andrew Newman. I'm the Principal Data Specialist at the Open Data Institute, and I lead on our work on Open Active, uh, and also I work on data assurance. Um, that's me. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. And I guess probably makes sense to go to you, David, next. Um, Hi, I'm David Dinnage. Hi, I'm David Dinnage. I'm the head of communications at the ODI, um, and I work closely on communications for Open Active. So, if you see any requests for blogs or case studies go out, that'll be me sort of like chasing you. And uh, just to flag, recently I've had uh, blogs from Tom, and I had a conversation with Dave this week about things like that. So, if anyone's interested in guest blogs or case studies for the Open Active website, then please drop me a line. Great, thanks, David. Uh, Dominic. Hi, everyone. Dominic Nilsson here from IMIN, uh, and I'm in the commercial team at IMIN, and what we do is we help to make uh, open data more accessible, uh, we augment it, and help to sort of integrate bookings across different platforms as well. Great, thanks, Dominic. Uh, Grace? Hi, yeah, I'm Grace. I work for SASP, so Somerset Activity and Sports Partnership. I'm their open data project officer, so I just coordinate the activity finder. Great, thank you, Grace. Uh, Tom. Hi, everyone. Tom Marley, co founder at Played. We help make sport and physical activity more accessible online using open data to create activity finders for lovely clients like Grace and others, and also have a booking platform which uh, publishes open data as well so on both sides cool thanks tom um and max hi guys max mclaughlin here um yeah also work at played uh, in the commercial and marketing side of things um yeah just help on helping on board um new active partnerships and yeah help make sports more accessible online really fantastic thanks max and thanks for joining great great to have you here um, and Dave uh, Barter is also here. Uh, you're on mute at the moment. <laughs> uh, Dave from Norto Guide, and yes, he's on mute. But yeah, I'll, I'll int introduce you on, on behalf of everyone. Dave, Dave Barter, that is. Um, great. So, uh, oh, I nearly forgot myself. Um, I'm Tim Corby, and I'm also a member of the ODI's uh, project team working on Open Active, um, and also the the chair of these AEF meetings. Cool. OK, so as I said, um, we're hoping to have Dara O'Sullivan. He should be joining us uh, about 11 o'clock from Sport Island to talk about some of their work. Um, but just in the first half of the meeting, while, while we're um, while we're waiting for him to join, um, I thought it'd be useful to give a quick update on the use case framework work that we're, we've been doing at the ODI. 
Um, and so I've got a couple of slides um, I can run through and trying to juggle all my different screens here just to hopefully not have everybody's faces covering over the slides for people on the recording so that they can't see them. Um, cool. Uh, so um, I just thought it'd be useful for those newer to the initiative um, and a kind of refresher for, for anyone who um, heard about this a, a while ago and, and has kind of not heard updates for a while. Um, a kind of brief refresher on where this thinking behind this work stream and, and this use case framework work came from. And so in 2021, um, there was an organization called Open Data Services Cooperative, or ODSC uh, for short, and they did a, a sort of review of Open Active and produced a report with some recommendations about um, where Open Active was and, and um, some recommendations for kind of future direction of Open Active. Um, and I've picked out a couple of the, of the most uh, pertinent recommendations um, related to this work stream. And, those were that the initiative um, should try and explore alternative value propositions beyond the kind of initial find and book um, and the, that kind of main use case that we have within the initiative of that, that finding and booking activities. Um, and then also uh, allowing for a shift to more effective and, and focused approaches for, for use case. So it's a really kind of tightly defined um, use cases with, with tightly defined problem statements and user user groups that that those problems affected and and solutions that open active could, could provide to to help um change that change those problems um and so based based on those recommendations there was this uh thinking that we needed to create a more consistent approach and um, that organizations in the community can use to um, more easily identify and collaborate with other organizations that share similar interests um, and objectives uh, in the sector um, in order to be able to explore uh, alternative value propositions for um, open active uh, related to those shared interests and, and deliver really focused use cases that that meet quite specific needs for specific users um, and just moving on uh, hopefully you'll all be fairly familiar with these but if, if you're not familiar or haven't really looked at um, the open active logic model and um, there's there's three kind of broad strategic outcomes for open active within within that uh, initiative logic model and those are to build a sustainable and independent initiative um, to ensure open active becomes uh, integral national data infrastructure and also to try and reduce inequalities to entry in in the sector and and improve um, and by doing so improve the health and well-being of uh, of the population as large um, and this kind of approach to, to having a common use case framework and, and more specifically a, a common approach for the community to um, MEL or monitoring, evaluation and learning um, will hopefully build a shared evidence base for the whole community against these strategic outcomes. Um, and we anticipate that probably most uh, use cases will be more related to the, the third uh, outcome, the reducing inequalities, but, but you know, there is there's potential for them to relate to, to the other ones as well. Um, but yeah, really hoping that that uh, shared evidence base will help uh, to demonstrate the impact of the initiative, uh, create alter the alternative value propositions that, that we were talking about on the previous slide, um, and also help us to learn about what is working in Open Active, what isn't working, and improve the quality of the initiative and the data infrastructure that we have uh, as a whole. Um, and so uh, the kind of golden thread that, that runs through the whole framework and, and the, the real key key part of the framework is, is this common approach to monitoring, evaluation and learning or, or MEL for short. And the benefit of having this common approach for the initiative uh, to measure against those uh, initiative strategic outcomes um, is to sort of aggregate uh, evidence around the impact of the initiative more widely competently and consistently um, and the approach uh, within the framework lays out four kind of simple steps um, to help use case communities and organizations in the in the open active uh, community to measure against those those strategic outcomes for the initiative um, and these four steps are firstly uh, defining smart objectives against uh, against those strategic outcomes and we anticipate that the most 
organizations and use case communities will probably be able to integrate or align their own um, MEL approaches to this. Um, you know, most most organizations will be will very easily aligned, particularly to that reducing in, inequalities um, outcome. Um, so we'll probably be able to align with their with their own existing MEL approaches, um, which will help to avoid organizations having to duplicate or, or you know, duplicate work. Now, the second step is then defining smart KPIs that can be, can be used to measure the success of those objectives. And thirdly, using those KPIs to measure progress at defined monitoring milestones um, during the development of the solutions to, to use, case, um, use cases. And then finally, um, and importantly, share, sharing the learning um, with the wider Open Active community in, in order to help grow and improve Open Active and, and help the community as a whole to demonstrate the impact of the initiative. And we really hope that this process will help create a sort of cycle of mutual value with, with Open Active as an initiative, providing standards, tools, and guidance, and also expertise, support, and facilitation from the community through these forums like the AEF and, and the steering committee and the W3C group. And in return, the use case communities will help to provide insights and, and evidence of um, impact, which can help um, open active to to demonstrate, as I say, demonstrate the impact of the initiative and, and improve the infrastructure and, and grow as an initiative. And um, this uh, is quick overview of, of the framework as a whole, and we've broken it down into five stages. And, and I think um, we've presented this a couple of times, both within the AEF and, and other forums. So I hope, hopefully, some of you may may well be familiar with this already. But we've broken it down into five stages, which cover um, firstly the identification of use case communities and then go through the development and evaluation of uh, use case solutions that bring use cases to life um, within those communities. Um, and we've tried to design the framework to be scalable from very small uh, or and simple use cases um, right up to large and uh, complex uh, use cases. Um, we also want it to be usable um, without being too burdensome, and we're aiming for this to provide guidance and support rather than being rigid rules that everyone has to follow. Um, and we also want it to be adaptable to different needs of use case communities and, and different use cases. It's designed to be uh, cyclical um, with the shared learning from use cases building an evidence library, as I've kind of touched on already, um, which will inform the iteration of existing use cases and also the development of, of new use cases. And we've really focused the guidance on the first couple of steps, the engage and convene and understand and plan, um, as well as the learn and publish um, stages, so sort of one, two and, and four. Um, as we're kind of anticipating that most use case communities and organizations within them will sort of have their own delivery processes in place um, and, you know, won't, won't necessarily really need loads of uh, uh, support or, or guidance with, with that. Um, and use case communities can, can follow the whole cycle in a step-by-step -step manner, um, as I sort of outlined here um, in, in that kind of cycle, or pick out individual tools and activities they need from the different stages um, without sort of having to having to do everything. But yeah, that, as I kind of mentioned, the the one thread that, that we're we're keen to um, encourage all um, use case communities to use is is the MEL approach to help really um, aggregate that uh, that learning um, from different use cases and, and build that evidence library, which which will help um, to demonstrate the impact of the initiative. Um, and as part of our commitment as an initiative to open working, we're also be encouraging use case communities to adopt um, open working practices uh, and we'll be offering the, the sort of open active open working channels um, for use of use case communities um, in order to help with that. So we've got Slack um, uh, for kind of communicating amongst members of communities. And we've also got a, a public uh, Google Drive, which is where the AEF slides are shared. If, if you've clicked through and looked through the, the uh, back catalog of those. Um, and we also have YouTube where these meeting recordings are shared um, and, and, you know, use case communities will be welcome to, to share meeting recordings and things in a similar way if they'd like to. And so just to give a kind of, 
very quick oversight of of each of these stages in in slightly more detail with, without um going you know into a real deep dive and um, so the initial stage about engaging and convening this is really um around identifying and engaging with existing communities or or building new use case communities then that can um then as a as a group identify prioritize um and fund and deliver use cases and um, so the the output of this first stage the main kind of output really is is hopefully established use case communities um and i keep using that word use case community and just to kind of give a quick definition of what that actually means and um, we see them as being new or existing groups of of people or organizations which will aim to collaborate uh, to explore the potential of open active within a specific um sort of thematic area or or sector um and this could be a very small group or, or even an individual organization focused on a very specific need or or it could be much larger groups with multiple organizations um which which work in, in a much more com complex way um and communities could um form around a predefined use case that they're already working on or or um that they have good evidence for already or they may form around a kind of broader area of interest and then collaborate as a group to define um, more specific use cases with, within that uh, broader area of interest so secondly um so once once the communities are kind of convened as a, as a group um it's then really about starting to try and identify and plan uh the delivery of of kind of viable um open active based uh use use cases and open active solutions to the to those use cases um which really address uh problem state kind of prioritize problem statements um and demonstrate the potential impact of open active and the main impact the, the main output hopefully of this from this first uh understand and um, plan stage um is a, a kind of defined use case and, and a roadmap for the de development of of a ways to test um the solutions to those use cases so that could be through pilot projects or um you know uh, put, putting something into a test area and testing it or you know a, a number of other a number of of number of other options and then once that kind of roadmap is in place, we then move into this kind of develop. And, and as I sort of touched on um, talking about the overview, we we haven't focused so much um, kind of guidance and detail into this stage as we, we anticipate that um, organizations and communities will have their own delivery processes that, that they would use um, within this stage to, to test um, the open active based solutions that they've identified and, and want to deliver. And solutions could include a, a whole range of things. They could be um, new data or uh, adaptations to existing data sets, it could, or it could be new technology, um, development of new technology, new processes, um, updates to the standards, or, or creation of new standard of new standards, or, or new kind of extensions to the existing standards. Um, or it could even be sort of developing guidance and learning to ha to help upskill particular particular people within within the sector or within a particular thematic area. And um, next uh, stage is around learning and publish, and this is this is quite an important sort of part of the MEL approach that we're we're advocating. Um, and this is really around evaluating the, the success of the, of the use case solution that has been tested in the previous stage um, and then um, sharing those insights with the open active community through case studies, blogs and um, reports um, updates on the, the KPIs and th things like that. Um, and that should really hopefully help um, this kind of evidence base that keep repeating. Um, to really to help demonstrate the impact of open active and then finally uh implement so uh, in the development stage um we kind of hopefully tested the the potential solutions then learn and publish kind of shared the learnings of what the successes have been what the the successes haven't been and then um for successful um tests or, or pilots and um, this final stage this kind of implement is where 
those successful um, pilots, those successful tests to them, and then either rolled out to a wider range of organizations or or moved from a kind of testing area to a live area, for example, that, that sort of thing. So kind of iterating and rolling out successful um, successful solutions into, into a more finalized product. Um, and so just finally, uh, that's kind of a, a very whistle-stop tour of the framework. And just finally, I want to kind of give an update on um, progress of use case communities and, and where we're at with some of the some of oh sorry I didn't move the slides on there and um, that was the implement slide <laughs> just give you a couple of seconds to uh, to read through that and um, and then yeah, as I say finally I just wanted to kind of leave um oh no sorry getting in a model here uh before I go on to the final slide I wanted to give a a quick um overview of where we feel that the AEF uh, how the AEF will play into this and what the AEF's uh, role will be um, and we saw we see the AEF as having a really important role throughout throughout the cycle of, of the um, the framework um, both uh, offering support to use case communities and particularly at the beginning identifying uh, use case communities and, and helping to convene use case communities by by um, you know, co collaborating as a as a group uh, and offering a platform for different organisations to to gather together and um, network and you know identify potential opportunities for creating use case communities. And then throughout the the rest of the the sort of cycle, offering a platform for use case communities to keep the wider open active community updated with progress and. Um, share share learnings and share updates at sort of monitoring milestones of, of how projects progressing and what successes have been um and then uh yeah sort of at the end and once you get to the kind of learn and publish stage really really sharing sharing uh, offering a platform for use case communities to share um share what's gone well what hasn't gone well um what the rest of the community can learn from and, and what the rest of the community can uh, the open active community that is can can use to to help um in their own work to to or to influence others with um demonstrating that the impact of open active and then now finally <laughs> so i got ahead of myself but finally i wanted to kind of give an overview of uh, some of the use case communities that we've already sort of been um, engaging with um, and working with um, and where we're at in terms of progress with with that. So um, we've um, con convened uh, over the last couple of months, we've convened a group um, focused around disability and inclusive support. Um, and there's around six or so organisations which have been involved in that group. Um, and we've sort of moved from the engage and convene stage into the understand and plan stage with that. Um, and we're having um, some good success with that group, some some really uh, productive meetings and some really interesting conversations. Uh, and, and the group um, is really keen for the development of use cases uh, within within that area to be uh, co-designed with, um, with user groups um, which have lived experience of, of um, living living with um, disabilities or long-term health conditions um, and that can really help to identify um, the, the the barriers that they may have and, and what is kind of critical um, data points that they, they really need to be able to um, make informed decisions about um, whether activities or, or whether opportunities to be active are appropriate for them um, and also to help with um, identifying any challenges with um, the technology um, that we have within the open active infrastructure right from the the standards right all the way through to the kind of end user facing platforms like the uh, activity finders and things like that so yeah some really good progress with that group um, and the kind of next steps will really be around uh, a lot of you to really be around identifying those user groups that we can we can co-design the use cases with um but yeah some some really good steps steps um within that one um the the second one down the activating school sites and i have to give credit to uh charlie merrick clark from from playfinder with this one who, who's um put a lot of time in, into supporting 
um, the uh, kind of catalyzing this this particular use case community. Um, and this one is a, a group of organizations that are working on um, opening school uh, facilities, um, which is a, a sort of funded um, program by the Department for Education, which aims to help uh, schools open up um, their facilities to the community um, and create closer community links um, and provide uh, places for, for people um, outside of school hours to, to, to go and take part in activity. Um, so um, to, some good progress again within that one and, and some really interesting um, works, um, some challenges also <laughs> within that one. But yeah, we're, we're hopefully um, making progress there and a lot of potential, um, potential for, for success within that group. And then we have a kind of whole range of emerging use case communities or, or use cases which are kind of still in that initial stage of trying to in, engage and convene all the different st stakeholders around them. Um, one of which Dave Bartu's on the call is uh, is heavily involved with, uh, and that's a, a data initiative um, in a place called Brixham in Devon, um, and some some really good. Uh, opportunities to to test open active within a really kind of hyper localized um community and mm. um, there so some some lots of potential there um and uh, there's there's a range of of um organizations within that emerging group um i probably won't go through all of them in detail um but just to touch on a couple of others so there's a whole range of um potential use cases and potential use case communities related to nhs um and health um and particularly um how we can more um sustainably and longer term create some interoperability between the open referral standard and the open active um standard um so yeah so some really interesting ones there so I think I'll probably just uh, leave it there and maybe um, open the floor for uh, a few um, questions uh, or comments or thoughts on that. Um, and then I think I maybe heard um, Dara joining us as well. Um, so yeah, just after uh, a couple of minutes for any questions or comments and then, and then we can pass on to Dara. Andrew, did you have anything you wanted to add to anything I've just said? Because you've been quite heavily involved in this uh, this work as well. The challenge is about. I think the challenge is about how we. Uh... Hello, I'm back. Can anyone hear me? Yes, good. Thanks. I'm, I'm not sure at what point I left you, but hopefully you filled in, I'm sure, Andrew, with great professionalism and authority. I, yeah, I, I did a bit of filling for you. Thank you. Cool. Um, in which case, um, I think we're maybe ready to hand over to Dara. Um, so uh, Dara uh, O'Sullivan is here from Sport Island or Sport Island Outdoors. I'm not, I'm not quite sure which uh, which brand you sit under, but um, yes, Dara, um, if I could hand over hand over to you. Thanks, Tim, and hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a conundrum for all of us, Tim. I think originally Sport Island has grown so that it's now kind of a pan sport ireland project um so i'll just share some slides quickly and uh, then show a little bit of, of what we've done with the system and then happy to to have a discussion after that is that okay sounds good yes thanks Laura. i've just made you a Great, call so you, you should be able to share with that yeah i think i can here has that shared Is that sharing okay? Yes, that looks good. Coming yep. through. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we we are developing and almost ready to launch a national database of sport and recreation um, in Ireland. 
It started four years ago with a feasibility study, which originally um, was just looking at opportunities to publicize um, places and ways to be active in the outdoors, um, which is why uh, Tim referred to, to the Outdoors Unit of Sport Ireland. Um, and once we took on that project, we realized pretty quickly that we were aiming too small, that if we were looking at just outdoor information, we would be begging and borrowing data for the rest of our lives um, and fighting for it to be accurate and, and current. So we kind of flipped it and looked at the project big and asked, OK, what would happen if we if we created a database here of every opportunity to be active in Ireland? Um, and we explored and found that um, this was something that was feasible that uh, uh, would provide benefit to the country. So we kind of refined these aims, get good authoritative data on sport and recreation, get the information out to the public um, to help people be more active, um, which of course ticks boxes across, you know, sport, recreation, health and so on. But we also realized we needed to give benefits back to the data providers, otherwise data, as, as I'm sure everybody here knows, um, will not be current and, and uh, accurate unless people are, are getting benefit from, from keeping it that way. And we realized we could uh, really work top down in the country by facilitating a lot of policies. Um, and that covered obviously sport and physical activity, um, health, and the project has mostly been uh, funded by the health sector to date, but other areas as well, transport, national development, data, um, and others, I think um, we have three government ministers aiming, fighting to launch this project in the next few months because of um, the wide range of the project and, and how they see it benefiting their areas. So um, I suppose really, yeah, there's two sides to it, as I was saying. One is getting people more active uh, and all the benefits that come with that. And the other side then is really um, a first for Ireland, a game changer around how um, sporting and recreation amenities and facilities are funded and, and planned and so on it's uh probably like in most places it's been a who shouts loudest uh type of scenario up until now uh whoever writes the best application form gets the most money um but uh thankfully government and uh you know both national and local are looking for more evidence-based um ways of doing things um collaboration and analysis and so on and, and we're hoping that this project will give them that so the data we're uh, collecting is um, sport and recreation, kind of formal stuff, sport uh, clubs and, and teams and pitches and swimming pools and all of that. Uh, public places where people can be active less formally um, to walk the dog or throw the frisbee or go for a dip, whatever. Uh, trails, which we already have a, a really good data set on in Sport Ireland Outdoors. And we also realize people need to know if something is suitable for them in terms of accessibility or can I bring the kids or can I park there and so on. So um, we want to collect all of that or we're in the process of it. Um, one of the principles of the project is that data providers are authoritative. So kind of working with um, with umbrella bodies who are stakeholders. So the likes of uh, local authorities and state agencies and national governing bodies of sport. Um, we're not planning to, at the moment, take um, you know data from one-off providers or uh, crowdsource, but that could change over time. But initially we, we realized we needed to build trust in the data, um, both on the public side and the stakeholder side. So we'll, we'll relook at that later. Um, and most of the data will be served to open data portals in the country. Um, stakeholders can house um, non-open data if they want, but anything that's appropriate to be uh, shared will be shared as open data. Uh, so the system structure, it kind of reflects the two sides of benefit. We, we obviously have a, a central um, database, but then two points of access, the, the public side, which is um, a website and app where they can look for suitable opportunities for themselves to be active. And the back end then, which is, um, I suppose, the really exciting bit in a way is where stakeholders have access to all the data, extra data that we'll provide for them um, and a, a suite of tools for them to use for for their purposes. And I'll, I'll show some examples uh, in a little while. Um, the use cases really are, are kind of a summary of what we've been saying. The public will um, be facilitated to be more active, um, things like social prescribing and, and so on. And stakeholders will have a, a access to, to data and tools for um, you know needs analysis and, and planning and so on. 
so uh, yeah, it's been a big project. Just you know, obviously, um, a lot of areas of the project going on um, officially now. Just not too long ago, it's been called Get Ireland Active um, is the official name for the project, and we're we're kind of finalising the the look and feel of that and developing um, you know videos and and all of that side of things. Um, and as I said, the funding has mainly been from the health sector in Ireland, um, with with some help from from Sport Ireland and and so on. Um, so I'll just show now um, a little bit of, of where we're at on it. Uh, if I reshare, I can show um, where the website is at the moment. Let's see. Wrong one. Too many things open here. Um, oh, let's do this one first. I, um, so this is more the the stakeholder side of it, where we've we've built um, a suite of dashboards for them to interact with the data and and query it and and analyze it um, on an intuitive basis. Um, everything is built in ArcGIS, if people are, are familiar with that. Um, so this is all the data amalgamated, and people can can uh, you know search and filter and and so on. Um, Sorry, Mike. I'm I'm down to one screen here today, and the panel, the control panel, is just blocking everything for me. Let me try and move it. Ah, uh, it does not want to move. Here we go. Uh, so then we have separate dashboards for uh, trails, for clubs, um, and for activity locations. So sorry, they're slightly unresponsive today with with so many open and, and being on Zoom. But yeah, it just gives the idea that that we have these pre-built for stakeholders to to go in and query and analyze the data. Um, there's also dashboards and tools for them to um, obviously work with their data, to edit their data, um, add data, delete data, quality check the data, and so on, um, like like this one. Um, but then as well as that, we're providing them essentially a kind of like a a, a mini GIS suite where um, we will give them uh, web web apps and so on where they can uh, do a lot of nice things with the data. For example, uh, this one is just uh, has all the data, but we we will provide a lot of layers for them to to um, to bring in an overlay and, and analyze. So things like deprivation index and, and population statistics, things that are commonly uh, sought for by by our stakeholders we will pre kind of uh, preload all of those for them. But they can bring in any other data they want um, as well if uh, either from the system by url if it's available on on an open data portal they can just drag and drop and it will show on the map um, or files if they're working locally like a lot of local authorities might have their own files that they want to bring in um, and then some other tools and like analysis tools for specific use cases say for this one it's around diversity of provision of of different sports um, you know our it's an example just that our our own research unit in Sport Ireland asked for their, they had the hypothesis that in Ireland in rural Ireland um, if you're not playing Gaelic games Gaelic football and hurling then you've got nothing to to go for so we said okay let's check and have a look in, in different areas what that actually looks like um, this one another one then that was requested by the Department of Education looking at uh, potential places to build new schools. Um, they're saying these days they have um, restrictions on, um, on on land essentially, and and it's very hard for them to build a school with um, sports facilities at the same site because of of the size of land available. So they're looking for places where they can build a school, but is within ten minutes walk of sports pitches and a sports hall. So again, we can just quickly. Um, uh, run an analysis tool that will find those locations. So the darker purple um, spots on this map show the areas in Galway City um, that would fall into that category of 10 minutes from, from both of those uh, facility types. So again, the, essentially we're giving them um, three levels of analysis. One is the pre-built dashboards that are fairly intuitive um, but limited. Um, secondly, they can play with uh, the GIS suite themselves and bring in data and analyze it and so on. And the third one is if they've got something much more complicated, they can come to us and we'll build it for them um, or show them how to build it. Uh, so that's that's essentially where we're at at the moment. I guess in we we um, in relation to um, Open Active, 
we uh, referred to the open active lists and, and models and so on as we were um, developing our data models and, and in consultation um, and got a lot of, of use from that. We, we um, of course, had to temper it a bit to align with what local authorities in Ireland currently have and, and use and, and the, the, the terms that they use and so on. But particularly around accessibility, we, we stuck as closely as we could to the open active model. Um, Two of the main differences I think that have come up when I've been in discussions with um, uh, you know different bodies in the UK is that our system at the moment um, hasn't gone down two routes. One is events. We're not bringing in events at the moment because they're very temporal and one of our key, I suppose, aims in the beginning is to build trust in the data and the system. And we know that events get cancelled last minute, but won't be taken down off our system and people might drive 100 miles to an event that doesn't exist and, and you know, we get the blame and so on. So events is kind of in our, in our, um, our roadmap for the future. And similarly, kind of a booking system um, is uh, down the road. We haven't gone that way um, just yet. Um, but it's more about sign, you know, understanding what's there um, for the stakeholders and the public and signposting people um, in terms of contact, de contact details and, um, and directions and so on. Um, let me see if I do have the, the website open. I will, ah, I do. I will go and just very quickly show that. Okay, so the website um, is um, getirelandactive.ie, um, but the main thing, I suppose, is there's a lot of peripheral bits. Um, we want this to be a hub where there's a lot of information around sport and activity in the country and getting active. But the main thing is we try to get people to the, the map search, and people can search either by everything on the map, um, free search and filter, or we've pre-built a number of themes for them. For example, accessible activities, which will have, um, you know, pre-filtered everything that that um, may be suitable for people with accessibility needs or dog friendly, where can I bring my dog? Um, the map then looks like this, where we have high level filters on the left, um, where it's kind of, you know, we, we think this will serve a lot of people, say, for example, the clubs and groups are, are in categories, indoor sports, target sports, water sports, uh, disability sports, so on, which um, will get people a lot of the way there. Trails have their high level activity and places to be active have, again, a, a high level category, beach, uh, a forest, um, indoor facility, outdoor facility. If people want to go deeper, then we have uh, a suite of kind of advanced filters that go, go more into things where we, people can look for 80 plus activities if they want for trails. There's a lot of uh, different things to search by and, and say for the locations. Um, yeah, and then every entry has its um, more details page giving contact details, um, you know, more detail location and directions to it. Sorry, things are a little slow loading on, on Zoom, but that's generally the, the shape of where we're at. Fantastic. Thanks, Dara. That was, um, that was great to see it, see it all in action. Um, I will open the floor to any questions. Um, I guess just a, a quick one from me, just while, um, while people are thinking. Um, you mentioned that you don't have um, events uh, currently. Um, I, sp I suppose it's a two-part question. One partly is um, you where you mentioned about events and booking, is that on your roadmap for something to include in the future? Um, and then the second part is um, in terms of what is an event versus what is what is an activity. Um, you've got the activities in in there, um, and that looks like it's more organisation based and, and place based rather than like an actual session. Is, is that right? Um, it's what we call them activity locations. So it's, okay. I suppose, activity location is anywhere an activity can take place. So that's that's the physical place. So we, we have three data models, essentially, or three data types. We have clubs, which is, you know, 
pe people that you something you join to take part we have trails um and then activity locations and um it's probably not not a common term but we, we thought facilities was a bit narrow because we wanted to include things like public spaces you know beaches and public parks and so on to include everywhere so um so you're right tim yeah it's 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 um kind of events anything that's temporal we we've stayed away from um it's really about the the um something that is less likely to change in the beginning um so it's as we say clubs trails and and places to be active and it is definitely on the roadmap to include um events and uh, potentially booking system down the line um we were surprised actually that i mean we knew it was something that the the public had uh, looked for you know we did quite a bit of market research before we um launched into the the, the full development phase um but it's actually come being called for more on the political side as well. Um, once we dem demonstrated this to ministers and, and so on, that was one of the first things they asked was, you know, when is events coming? So it may be kind of even earlier on the roadmap than we had initially planned. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any questions for Dara? Yes, yeah. I've got one. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Dara. That was really interesting. I thought the data visualization, uh, especially, was quite quite sort of fascinating. The sort of level of depth as well. Um, I just had a question around, I guess, m mostly the leisure operators, uh, which is sort of the work that I've been doing. Um, is there? Uh, you mentioned that the sort of activity information is sort of authoritative by those activity providers. I think so. Those are the people that are responsible for uploading that information. I'm curious to sort of see how that information about those activities and those locations is uploaded um, and, and sort of whether it's on your platform or whether it's through their booking system. Yeah, thanks, Dominic. Um, so say in terms of the ledger industry, the data comes in from their umbrella, umbrella group, which is kind of like a national governing body um, called Ireland Active. They're essentially the national governing body for the leisure industry so they cover um leisure centers swimming pools um you know gyms and so on so at the moment we're, we're taking the data from them um and our, our data ingestion has three different options um our preferred one and the one um which we uh which is the main way data is coming in is effectively an excel template um we in consultation we were surprised actually when we went out to consult with with the stakeholders in the beginning we initially thought everybody would be asking for direct feeds or direct uploads or whatever but actually they were all very happy and and thought it was the easiest way to do it is to to complete an excel template one line per you know per entry per club or per location and send it on to us and we upload it which is working really well but it, it hasn't worked for all of them some of them like the leisure industry is one of the exceptions where we have an online form um for an individual club or a leisure center or whatever to to fill in the data themselves um that so that that's that's proved popular with some of the the um the organizations and then the third way is we can take data kind of in a directly GIS way by APIs and things like that. And again, we were a little surprised that uh, only one or two bodies wanted that way. They they generally went for the Excel. Then once the data is in the system, they can manage it and, and update it and um, keep it current within there. And um, again, we, we were very happy to hear that that was their preferred way. They preferred to keep it um managed within the site rather than somewhere else and bringing it in on a on a periodic basis so um a few things fell our way that, that in that one that's really interesting thank you yeah thanks hi much. dara um good to see you again thanks for that sorry i've been having a bit of hey, time on my, um, my phone um yeah i think that's really interesting um touched on a few new points um i think from that point around where they prefer to upload it in one place. Is that going to be the single source of truth which powers everything going forward or is that open to change? Because I know that from experience, as soon as people are have got multiple things that they need to keep up to date, it doesn't get kept up to date and then the data becomes outdated almost as, in, as soon as it's published. 
is that have, have you had consultation on that side before or what what's the plan to keep her up to date basically without relying on people yeah um we're a lot of the way there on that one um i guess the, the, we certainly built this to be the single source of the truth um and most of the organizations we've been dealing with are happy to to do it that way to um but um in in some cases there's a bit of a reluctance that they have their own systems that they prefer to to manage things primarily in um but uh, again there's there's two things i guess one is we're um as we're finalizing this we're we're we have a, comp uh, a consultancy company in to develop a management strategy and they've been doing a lot of um, interviews and workshops with the with the data providers um and it's it's kind of backing that up that that almost all of them are happy to see this as the single source of the truth for those that are a little bit more reluctant we will be relying on um a bit of top down pressure essentially um which we seem to have because um as i said like the the government in ireland is seeing this as pretty much a flagship project you know and there's there's three ministers there's you know sport there's uh health and there's kind of the rural development minister are kind of pretty much fighting over which one gets to say this is their project so we have that top-down pressure as well if we need it to get any um any of the uh you know the likes of a local authority who who isn't fully playing ball we we you know we don't want to play hardball but um it looks like um essentially the from high level government down this will be backed to be that single source of the truth and something that um is uh hugely valuable um so is is worth putting that bit of pressure on so while we can't say 100% yet um um we think we're we're uh, well on that way, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, that's well explained. Thanks, Dara. I think, yeah, uh, we touched on it the other day, but for, from my perspective, I think while it's kind of stat yeah. Yeah. static information, it, it makes like that approach will work really well. I think as soon as it becomes events based is where you'll probably uh, come into that decision of of how that are people are people that are creating yeah. the event using that single source of truth to create them or are they or oh, integration into whatever their single source of truth is i guess that's the the challenging bit to navigate yeah that you're right, absolutely right um you know and, and that's part of the reason we didn't go with events in the beginning um that we we want people to you know get to know and understand what this can do with static data and then look at events because yeah it's it's a it's a much um more difficult realm in terms of of questions like that um and i think once we do start exploring that um in you know in our in our next phase or whatever i think we'll definitely be coming back to groups like this for a bit of wisdom on it because i think it's it's something that hasn't been done in ireland um at all so we, we have a lot to learn and, and hopefully we'll have to you know that there's there's wisdom and mistakes made and whatever on 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 your side that that can can guide us a bit and, and hopefully we can we can align models and all of that as well because for sure one of the things that um one of the other reasons we, we didn't look at events as well or that that i've been a bit wary of is is just the population density in ireland just isn't there um you know if, you, if you're looking at um kind of anything where there's financial transactions or bookings and things like that obviously volume is something that that's very important there to to make it worthwhile whereas in Ireland especially outside of Dublin there's just there's no population essentially so um we need there may not be kind of there may be less um financial reasons to do it so we'll need to get it right you know um we we probably have um yeah as i say kind of less financial incentive to do it so the reasoning and and the the scope to get things wrong is you know it has to be right on track great thanks tom and dora um we're just going to the last couple of minutes but i think andrew had um his hand up so i don't know if we'll just come to andrew maybe for the the last question yeah thank you it's more i think it's more of an observation than a question and i have to leave in one minute so i'll be really quick um 
So, so I think one thing that you mentioned, Dara, a couple of times was that you've done quite a lot of work in terms of defining activities and classifying activities. Um, one of the kind of fundamental pro products we have in Open Active is a reference data set of activities. And I think it would be a really good first step to collaboration might be actually looking at those two lists and seeing how they compare yeah. um, and perhaps trying to combine them so that there is a single list. I think a single list of sport and physical activity types it could be really valuable for open active for your project and actually more widely in, in, in the industry but a really interesting presentation it's nice to see you again and now i have to go thanks okay <laughs> thanks andrew i'll respond to that to the others when you go um <laughs> yeah i think that that's uh that's spot on i think you know we we did look at the the open active list and and um for different reasons we couldn't align fully with it mainly because we're you know i suppose because sport ireland is the body that funds and and looks after ngbs in the country we we had to work with um their kind of naming system for their own sports and so on so that that we had them on board um and we realized we probably needed a, a bit more of a flat structure um, than the open active model in in the beginning um, and we defined our own categories but i but we but while I, always i was very careful not to go too far down that road so that we could have future alignment um so i think um i'd love to to start uh, collaborating and, and seeing where where we can um, map our our uh, our our models and and see about amalgamating them in future yeah Definitely, I think that'd be really useful. And I, th I think um, I think you you mentioned to me in the past that you've got a sort of steering committee or something. And I think um, yeah, it would be it'd be really useful to to have a session with the Open Active Steering Committee and your steering committee to explore some of those strategic um, levels. Definitely, um, particularly around where you where you said you've you've got quite close links to the health sector and um, and some yeah. funding them and it sounds like you've got quite good government buy-in as well which perhaps open active hasn't quite achieved yet so i think there's some some really useful conversations there potentially at the steering steering definitely committee. brilliant yeah i'd be very happy to yeah. that'd be great thank you um and i guess um if anyone else has any questions or anything move for dara we can either pass them on to dara through by me or or um um, if I share the link to um, Sport Island's website, I think Dara's contact details are all, all on there as well. So um, you can get in touch with him directly. But um, yes, thank you very thank much you. for joining us. That's been, that's been great. Really, really interesting. Really great to see the work you've been doing. Um, and thanks everyone else for, for joining. Yep. Thanks, um, Tim. And thanks, everybody. Yeah, delighted to meet you all. Um, yeah, we'll, um, we'll hopefully see you all again. Um, perhaps not you, Dara, but hopefully everybody else in a couple of weeks' time for, for the next uh, AF meeting. So hope you all have a good weekend and, and speak to you all soon.